I hope you're really not listening to all these crazy things that I say. <laughs> Well, they don't make it easy for you, do they? <laughs> Hope we get some people to come out since it's all sunny, you know. <laughs> How are you? Thank you. Gorgeous. Thanks. As usual. <laughs> mm. Hi. What you do? Oh, okay. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. <laughs> You're just young enough you can do that. I, I can do it one day and that's it. Oh. Although I was out all day yesterday, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no. I'm trying to squeeze in actual relaxing between working too much. That's really smart. It's, it's, I'm just now learning that. Pace, I call it pace. Yeah, myself. I know. And I find I can do almost anything I ever did if I pace myself. But I'm a lot older than you are, and I've had some health problems, as you know. And mm, yeah. I to promote the poet podcast. Come, come. You can't buy it right here, you know. <laughs> it's not for sale. So, what have we got? Oh, these are the bios. No, your, you had the order thing. Oh, no, they're, they're gone because there's some misspellings. <laughs> I spelled Brian's name. Oh, that's just here. Yeah. Okay, I have to reiterate the thing that it needs to be two minutes, not five. Okay. okay. Um, so I think for Nick, it's, we'll just, he'll say, what order? So what else? Nick will go first to yeah, introduce at, whatever. After Chris, yeah. Nick is here. And maybe we should number for Nick who goes first so that he sees it on this. Oh, is he, so is he going to introduce the order? He is. Okay, then. And yes. maybe I think here, because this is the first time he's going to talk about who's reading today. He says, today will be Jordan and Felicia, so maybe you can just number them. Okay. 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 So if Rajni comes... He'll introduce Pesha, and then he'll come right up after Pesha's done, and then say, here's who's reading today. I see. Cool. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four. <laughs> I don't want to be the only deserved sea poet there. Cool. Hi, did you hear me say Flint is here? Hello. Did you hear me say that? I didn't. I'm very happy because I only have an ancient email for you. <laughs> I haven't changed my email in Believe me, years. this is ancient. Oh. <laughs> Unless you get email from Hedgebrook. No, 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 They don't even have that email address anymore. <laughs> That's in my address book. Uh -huh. And because I kept seeing you, I never changed it. Because if I wanted to tell you something, I just told you. Oh. My God, you become a poster, a, 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 a postered woman. <laughs> I, I love it. You open up publications and there is the smiling face, you know. He took the picture. Did you? Yes. No, I don't know. I put it on the last one. I did put it on there. Oh, that's just shocking. Oh, but did you see my giant head picture in the PI? Oh, yeah. That's how, I, that's how I knew to be here. Oh. What's your giant head in the PI? Yeah. I, you no, know, it's like, it's life size. You called me about it and I didn't get a chance to pick oh, it up. Oh, my gosh. It. It. It's in yeah. what's happening, I think. And yeah, you yeah. open it up and it's like, whoa, that's what I mean by poster. <laughs> Yeah, it's Maybe pretty. It's you're gonna be on buses next. You know, I'm working right? on it. When I was sitting in the, I had a meeting and I, <laughs> I'm working on it. I was sitting in a meeting and I turned around and my picture was, I didn't know. And I kept talking and I looked back and I said, Hey, that's me. <laughs> and then I said, uh, then I picked it up. I was kind of annoying, I guess, because I was excited and we were trying to meet. You know, you think that the person organizing the event We just happened to be meeting in the library at uh, Beacon Hill, and then I looked over, and then I said, hey, my name is on here twice. And then someone said that they'd opened up the, um, or they got email from the library and that my head was 
That's what people keep saying. We keep seeing your head. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not from Philly. Oh. But this gentleman back there is with the hat on. <laughs> okay. So you guys should get together. <laughs> Where are you from? Right here. Right here? Right here. Okay. They okay, say so you're too important to sit in the back of the bus. I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I don't know enough about being important sitting somewhere or not. You keep moving away from me. No, I live here. I've been living here for 11 years. No, new person on the block? No, I'm no new person at all. That's what she's trying to tell you. Center for the book at the Seattle Public Library. This sounds very loud. On behalf of the Seattle Public Library, City Council President Nick Licata and Bumbershoot, I want to welcome you to the Central Library and thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, let me start by acknowledging the Seattle Public Library Foundation, whose support makes possible all of our library programs. The foundation represents thousands of people in our community who make gifts, large and small, to support their public library to buy books and materials for our collections, to present free public programs, and to help with the renovation and expansion of our libraries. So if we have any library foundation donors here with us today, we want to say thanks very much for your support. Thanks also to the Seattle Post Intelligencer for generous promotional support for library programs, and Starbucks for today's refreshments. We have lots of great free library literary programs coming up this spring, and I'll just mention a few. Uh, this Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock, we have Deborah Rodriguez, the author of Kabul Beauty School. This is an amazing story, an amazing sort of humanitarian story that turns into uh, she opens a beauty school in Kabul. She's a hairdresser from Michigan who goes to help as a nurse's aide and what becomes the most important to both the Westerners uh, doing aid there and to the Afghan women is her skills as a beautician. There's also um, a documentary called The Beauty, beauty Academy of Kabul, which is also worth seeing. She'll be here Tuesday night. Um, also then, coming up on May 3rd, we have Atul Gawande, who is a Harvard-trained surgeon, a 2006 MacArthur Fellow, a New Yorker staff writer, He's just published his second book, a collection of essays that's getting wonderful, wonderful reviews and feature articles, including one recently in the New York Times. His essays are called Better, A Surgeon's Notes on Performance, but they're really about how sort of going beyond just the um, what's required and doing even more <laughs> diligence and so forth is what we all need to succeed in life as well as as a surgeon. We also have the library's annual internationally renowned <coughs> Seattle Read series. Jhumpa Lahiri will visit Seattle May 14th and 15th, and she'll make three public appearances to talk with readers about her book. There are flyers on all of these events on the front table. So parking in the Central Library garage today is available for the regular Sunday rate of $5 for up to four hours. Um, today's program is being videotaped by the Seattle Channel for later broadcast. It's also being recorded for library podcast, and you can subscribe to podcasts on the library's website, www.spl.org. So now I'm going to turn things over to our host today, City Council President Nick Licata. Thank you, Chris. And uh, welcome to everyone in the celebration of a Jordan Imani Keith's uh, term as a poet populist for Seattle. And I also want to thank Chris again and the library's uh, Washington Center for the Book for her continued support for these readings. Um, and I also want to thank um, Gary Gibson and Tom Spear for the Seattle Channel. They're doing a documentary on the election of the poet populist. And my understanding is after the next election is when they'll complete it and then it'll be aired. Um, and I think, as uh, I've mentioned in the past, this is a unique program because it really does combine the idea of democracy, since we're electing a poet populist, and art, since we're talking about poetry and perhaps the most creative form of communicating to one another. So I, I'm pleased that we're continuing this effort, and I'm expecting to, to grow. And for those of you who don't know, um, Jordan 
um, won the election last year when over a thousand votes, well, about a thousand votes were selected. She received the most votes. And this year, we're going to expand the number of uh, literary curators and um, literary organizations that uh, will be contacted and invited to um, nominate people, uh, well, nominate poets to uh, be in the election for the poet populace. Um, the plan uh, is that we'll develop a long-range plan to, for the program to be self-sustained. Um, I don't think Bob Rudman is with us today, but he's working closely with us in getting the organization together in a way that we haven't been in the past so that we can sustain it in the future as well. Um, and from my activities in National League of Cities, I've been introducing the idea of poet populace to other cities, and uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts has adopted it. And I know Reno Nevada, was, Reno, Nevada is also very interested in doing that. So hopefully we can have poet populace across the country. I think that would be great. Um, for nominations this year, um, what we're going to be doing is that uh, beginning Monday, April 23rd, so the week from this coming Monday, uh, if you go to the website uh, seattlepoetpopulous.org and you can download an application, uh, the nomination process then will run through Friday, June 8th. I think it's about six weeks, so it's a long enough period we should solicit enough uh, good nominees. Well, I, uh, WW, yeah. I assume people knew it was WW point it's, Seattle. No, maybe not. Okay. It goes to www. a different page. Www. Point Seattle dot org. Um, and then um, the voting will run from Friday, June fifteenth, through Wednesday, August sixth. Again, I think it's about six weeks. And finalists then will assemble on the stage at Bumper Shoot, as we've done in the past, and uh, there we'll announce the the winner. Now, um, I'm pleased today to introduce a number of, of great Seattle poets, and I'm going to begin uh, with last year's 2005-2006 Poet Populist for Seattle, Pesha Joyce Gertler. And uh, she's a member of the English faculty at North Seattle Community College. And in 1981, she founded Self-Discovery for Women Through Creative Writing, a writing community for women of all ages, backgrounds, including new and experienced writers. And she also co-founded in 1987 with Cecilia uh, Andrews, After Long Silence, a monthly reading series for women poets and writers that now includes male voices as well. And she's also been very active in the community. And she's pointed out marching in, uh, and, uh, marching in uh, groups and rallying in support of many progressive causes. And I, I can testify that. I've seen her there. So now I'd <laughs> like to introduce uh, Pesha Joyce Gertner. Thank you so much, Nick. Not only for that wonderful introduction, but also for your support of the arts. It's so wonderful to have people in politics who also know the value of the arts, and especially poet populists. I'm, I have a bias there, of course. And I also want to thank Frank Video for your ongoing support of the poets in ways too numerous to, to list here. I, I've just been told that I have a bit of a time crunch, so I'm going to have to cut short what I was going to say to you. I, I wanted to mention that so you wouldn't think that I was not as passionately enthused about this as I have been in the past. Um, I just wanted to mention that my first assignment as poet populist was to go to uh, Catherine's place, which is a shelter for families, many of whom are from Somalia, Kenya, and Liberia. And yesterday, I went there to work with the children on a uh, poetry writing workshop. They were amazing. I, I went a week before as well, and I'll probably be going back again. The point I thought that would be the best is to read some excerpts from their writing to you, because that would speak as well as anything I might have to say about the value of the program. Um, I'll just read maybe four excerpts, just one line each. The first was by a second grade child, and he wrote, he was from uh, Kenya. And he wrote, I want to go back to Kenya and visit my friends and show the world who I am by helping the homeless. How many second grade kids have that kind of sensibility? I mean, I was blown away by that. And then the other one was a fourth grader, also from Kenya. What I want to do in Kenya is help the poor. And then another one that I like very much 
was music is like God in my ear. Mm. I thought that was wonderful. And then the last one I'll share with you is by a fourth grade girl, and she wrote, I wish I could be a rainbow so I could come on earth and land in Catherine's place. Mm. Isn't that wonderful? That's what nice. they're going to do with this is there are two artists involved, and they've made a sculpture, or they're in the process of making a sculpture, and they're going to put their poems or lines from their poems and cast them in bronze and include them in the sculpture. So I think that's, that's very exciting. They, they, we convince them that they're going to be famous because that will be there forever, <laughs> unlike our books, which can be put aside on a shelf somewhere. This will be out there in public always. Um, I wanted to share that with you because... That's an example. Those children's words speak as clearly as anything that I could say about the value of the poet populist movement. In other words, although this sounds sloganish, I, I do believe that the value, one of the values of the poet populist movement is that we take the poems out of the ivory tower and out into the world, out into the streets, out to where the people are. And I think that there's an immense privilege and gift in being included, being involved in the world of the poem, and that that needs to be <coughs> shared with others. Not just the reading and the understanding, not just to create audiences for the people in the ivory towers, but to give them the right, the, the, the others, all the people outside of the ivory tower, the right to experience the exhilaration and the joy and the healing of writing their own poems. And these kids were one example of that. That can be found in all kinds of places. Certainly in my year, I, I experienced it in numerous places that I went with a poem and with evoking their own poems as well. So I won't, I won't say any more than that, though I would love to, but um, I do want to encourage you to do everything that you can to find different people that you know who are poets, who are writing, who are working in the community in some way, poetry activists perhaps, and um, nominate the poet that you would like to see take this role next year. And um, I know it felt so wonderful to me to have someone like Jordan following me. It felt really good. I felt so assured that the program would continue, and I hope that this will continue to be true. So we're depending on you to do what you can to keep this going. It's an invaluable gift to the entire community and hopefully to the entire society as it's expanding. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you very much, Pasha. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate all the work you're doing with youth as well. I mean, it's not just what we do individually in groups like this, but as they say, it's for the next generation. Um, so our next uh, poet is Felicia Gonzalez, and she was born and raised in Cuba, and her poems have been published in various anthologies, including Word Thursdays. And uh, in, 2000, in the year 2000, she was also a Jack Straw writer, and a 2006 recipient of an individual artist grant from the Mayor's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs for her forthcoming chap chapbook, Recollection Graffiti. I'd like to introduce Felicia now. Felicia? Good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to see that uh, on a sunny Sunday, there's an audience for poetry in Seattle. <laughs> I would like to start by um, reading a poem uh, in honor of uh, a colleague in the writing community and in the activist and teaching community who um, is currently involved in uh, a legal battle, and I, I thought that he might be here this afternoon, Rajni, who I believe many of us know him, and would like to uh, share this piece um, written after Adrian Rich's From an Atlas of the Difficult World, and as Pesha mentioned, it's so important that we understand how poetry is part of the larger world and certainly Audrey and Rich is a poet who for over uh, 50 years as an adult working poet um, an educator has been putting that into practice and she was here last year and if you had an opportunity to see her I think it's exciting um, to witness how all those all of us our bodies may become frail but our spirits 
oftentimes as we grow older become more fierce. What I know. I'm reading your poem where solitude does not exist and blackness is a sin. I'm reading your poem in corners where my hair turns white and we stumble on the accumulation of life. I'm reading your poem where the police check on houses looking for another who may look like me. I'm reading your poem where my mother's smile leaves a demarcation of bitterness swallowed. I am reading your poem where only skeletons live. I am reading your poem where the alphabet is a weapon, sometimes in the wrong hands. I am reading your poem in an act of defiance, knowing silence will not save my life. Okay. Thank you, Nick, for your wonderful introduction, and also thank you, Jordan, for including me in this program. As Nick mentioned, um, I, was, uh, I had the very good fortune of being selected for an individual artist grant from the city of Seattle, and uh, there is a chapbook that's forthcoming. Part of that work, Recollection Graffiti, has a lot to do with um, having been born and raised in Cuba and then experienced life in the U.S. for over a 30-year period before returning to Cuba, and how um, home can sometimes seem both very close and yet also very far. And I'd like to share with you, um, in entering uh, several poems that have to do with Cuba and with um, that experience of simultaneous life in two cultures, um, from a series of works that I translated with a colleague, Judith Kerman, who some of you may have met um, several years ago when she was here doing a project for Poetry on the Prairies, a radio program in the Midwest. Um, what I'd like to read to you, first in Spanish and then in English, is a very short poem from a Cuban poet, Dulce Maria Loinas, and she was born in 1902, so just after um, Cuba gained its independence from Spain. And um, Dulce lived a very long life. She died in 1997, and so she saw many comings and goings in the last century. And for much of that time period, her work sort of fell into this quaint readership that it was considered somewhat old-fashioned, maybe not quite speaking to um, some of the ideology of the 1959 revolution. And then in 1992, so she's you know, five years before her death, um, she wins the Miguel de Cervantes Prize, which is the highest award in the Spanish-speaking literary world. And there's all this limelight that's now shed upon her in the last five years of her life. And that's really when I learned about her work and uh, undertook some of this translation with Judith. And so I'd like to share this with you as a way of kind of entering um, that space, that space that I call Cuba. Está bien lo que está. Está bien lo que está. Sé que todo está bien. Sé que el nexo y la razón y hasta el designio. Yo lo sé todo. Lo aprendí en un libro sin páginas, sin letras y sin nombre. Y no soy como el loco que se quema los dedos trémulos para separar la llama rosa de la mecha negra. What is good is good. What is is good. I know it. Everything is good. I know the nexus and the reason and even the design. I know it all. I learned it in a book without pages or letters or title. And I am not like the madman who burns his trembling fingers trying to separate the rosy flame from the black wick. <laughs> Vex geographies. This bears the uh, quote from Marcel Proust as a prologue. The countries which we long for occupy a far larger place in our actual life than the country in which we happen to be. 
vexed geographies. Desire transformed the house, bridging the blank spaces while we learned to take surprise as gift. Earth is not absolute, only the memory. Wood carried in the belly of an ailing ship, salvaged desire to transform a house. Rain coming and staying while grandmother's hair braids itself into the furniture, laughing and taking the surprise as gift. Cane fields cut like the shorn heads of country boys, boiling sugar scent in the folds of clothes, yet managing to heat a desire that transformed a house. Now, high summer, red clay in cool, dark tobacco leaves sleep like precious moths. It's smoke, a surprise gift. Grandfather's square thumbs mark this entire map, but here is the evidence of desire transforming a house and history surprising when bearing gifts. This poem is a territory after Harriet Mullen, who if you don't know her work, I, I would encourage you to read Harriet Mullen's work. Um, she's actually teaching again at Naropa um, in Boulder, Colorado this summer, and uh, her work is very playful and also at the same time very challenging. This poem is a territory. Poetry changes our shape swallowing sparks and ingesting fire. The word moon, sharp, biting, will not cross my tongue. In the throat, iron becomes smoke. In the mouth, silk and blood. Name two words for falcon and one for dream. Cazador, la luna creciente, ladrón. And I've been playing a bit with um, villanelles, and uh, particularly as sometimes my work incorporates Spanish. Um, seeing what that's like with, uh, with a form that many of us remember being tortured with in high school and uh, <laughs> <laughs> have since then not sought out. Um, so this is entitled Canela, which in Spanish means cinnamon. Canela. Words are anticipated rain, dropping on foliage, finally relenting growth while others sleep. Casting about family photographs, tracing likenesses, and composing conspiracies that make words like anticipated rain. How to be certain which house belongs to whom? Children at dangerous play while others sleep. What to make of the angle of Aunt Estella's head? Who was drifting from her gaze? Could she have been anticipating rain? A sudden tangle of trumpet vine reflecting across my mother's white dress. Scalloped edges she worked while others slept. On my own thin skin raced the tracks of red, red earth from Guida, indistinguishable from blood. Words heavy with rain, while other lives sleep. I think, as um, Pesha mentioned earlier, that part of what oftentimes we go to for poetry is a sense of place and a sense of making sense. For me, a lot of that has to do with family and um, making sense of family and uh, also investigating what does family really mean and what role does language play in what we consider family. And, you know, there are, of course, language families and um, chosen families as well as those that are the families you were born into. This next poem, hopefully you'll hear those things at play. 
An opacity is seen in the anterior segment of the right lobe. And I should mention that that refers to a part of our lung. So, an opacity is seen in the anterior right segment of the upper right lobe. News reaches me like debris piled on the highway, stray bits and pieces, miles from certain meaning. Your work-worn hands cradle a pineapple, the first you've coaxed from inhospitable soil. I will always remain curious about what makes us family. In the absence of physical resemblance, the filial must be embedded elsewhere. These four corners align as a genetic compass, not determining course, but charting the route of affection. Mm -hmm. So I'll read uh, just three more pieces, and this next one is sort of the last one that's situated in, in Cuba before we, we travel elsewhere. And um, it's a poem that I began working on uh, when I was part of the first U.S. Cuba Writers Conference in uh, 2000. And uh, it's a program that unfortunately, as many um, cultural exchanges between the U.S. and Cuba um, has now ceased, which is unfortunate in terms of the dialogue between poets from both the U.S. and Cuba. And here in Seattle, we're very fortunate not only to have um, city council appreciating the role of poetry in society, but also a strong um, Cuba Friendship Society that looks to build relationships between people to people and, and better understanding that way. And this is entitled Recollection Graffiti. Havana Night, moon the echo of roundness, fingers strain and tug like long drinks and slow music. Why can't I dream now that I'm here, the time of waiting, the purse of anticipation, the sleepless moisture of midnight, do not bring me Cuba. At once familiar and foreign, fierce and familial, you who have stormed and stolen my dreams for almost 30 years, now smirk and wink as I drift off to sleep each night earlier than the last. The images I trap in my $3 disposable camera are ghosts of themselves chilled to the temperature of cocoa ice cream at the 24-hour bakery in Vedado. Maldita noche, deprive me of sleep. Steal every memory, every fondness. Malevolent night, take from me the task of remembering and wanting. Maldita noche, strip from me all desire to smother my fish soul in your darkness. Malevolent night, teach me to want no more than the memory. Teach me to dream while awake. So this next piece um, is one of two pieces set in uh, New York City, a uh, place I know dear to Brian's heart. Um, I'm going to read it a little bit. And, um, it's another point of navigation. Swimming in Mercury. 25 years later, you finally say the words, the warning, your fear, across the table in Manhattan where you came for the summer and stayed. We are the uncertain and trembling faces of girlhood. Me forcing 12, you barely eight. If I become sick and they can't figure out why, you whisper, tell them about the mercury. I look in your eyes and tell you how I first saw your hands bound in the heavy silver, your startled eyes at the warning of poison. This savage toy in your palms whose rivulets fascinated your fingers. Mm -hmm. And I'll close with this, um, Carnaval Carnal. 
Nueva York, fabrication of shipwrecked slaves, appropriating your name. Eres mia, I have tamed you as my lover, mangy coyotes riding the subway, an underground life of third world nightmares, Carnaval de Ochun. Any dandies left in this town better clear off my streets. On Tuesday at four o'clock, we'll be letting the rest of the animals out of the zoo. What mask will you wear? Mother warning you against me, warning me with a sideways glance. No pienses en traer esa muchacha a mi casa, signifying I'm no better than the cat in the bodega across Clinton Street who left kittens on flower sacks. But remember, patience of the universe is riding on my right hip. I'll draw that smile from your lips, tease the tongue from your mouth with my perfume. Before three moons have passed, you will be my devotee. You will leave your mother's house. Ya conocerás mi baile. I will teach you my dance. Thank you. That was beautiful, Felicia. It reminds me of all those Spanish classes I took in college and still can't remember how to speak. The <laughs> challenge is still waiting me. Um, our next uh, poet is uh, Brian McGuigan, who is our current poet curator uh, for my committee, where we uh, introduce a new poet every time our committee meets, which is twice a month. And uh, rather than have either myself or Frank Video get involved in the politics of who to choose, we, we slough off that responsibility to somebody else, and we, we got Brian here to, to take up that burden. So Brian currently works at the uh, Richard Hugo House and is an editor of When It Rains from the Ground Up and producer of A Night of Cheap Wine and Poetry, held at Richard Hugo House. McGuigan is the author of the poetry collection More Than I Left Behind, by Spankstra Press, 2006. Brian, please join us. Hey, everybody. Hey. How's it going? Okay. Um, this is the second time I've ever read here before, and uh, I really like this. I like the stadium seating. It's kind of like being at a baseball game. You know? <laughs> Waiting for somebody to come up and down the aisles throwing peanuts or uh, Cracker Jacks or something. That would be pretty cool. Too bad us poets are too broke to afford those, huh? Like five <laughs> bucks for a bag of peanuts at the game? What are they thinking? Uh, before I get to the poems, which I'm going to spread out here, um, I want to say that I'm the, the co-founder of the organization that nominated Jordan as the poet populist. And you can clap, come on, you can clap for that. And uh, I think she's one of the best poets we have in this city. She's so fitting for this title because she picks up any cause she can find and runs with it. She's all for <laughs> representing people. Uh, if there's any injustice going on in the world, Jordan is on top of it. And she will not let anyone get away with it, which is why she's so great to be the, the poet populist. So Thank you. Appreciate it, Jordan. I'm glad you won. <laughs> you definitely deserve it. So uh, I don't really know what to read. I just moved, and I got all my stuff in boxes. There's crap <laughs> everywhere. And I'm like, what do I read? I haven't been writing that much lately either, so I'm kind of going to do a little grab bag here. Old stuff, new stuff, stuff that I probably shouldn't be reading anyway because it's not that good, but what <laughs> the heck, I'll try it. Uh, I'm going to start with the oldest one, and then maybe there's a progression. We'll see. So I wrote this poem a couple of years ago, and uh, it's actually in my chat book. And well, I'm not going to give any context, I'll just go ahead. It's a, uh, well, a little bit of context. <laughs> I wrote it in response to the, the growing burdens of adulthood, which I'm just getting used to now at 25. Um, adulthood is kind of tough, let me tell you. I miss the days when you could just be a kid and do whatever you wanted. <laughs> so that's what this poem is about. It's called Before BD and Student Loans. <laughs> <clears throat> we were tough then. Played knuckles with two decks, 
drank 40s on train tracks, cursed at our mothers. They never liked that. Or when we wouldn't answer our pages, didn't eat dinner with the family, sat in our rooms with a plate full of cool and a cup of attitude. No one could stop us. We ran the streets past dark on the trains in the parks with young girls in plaid vests and skirts grow high up the thighs. We tugged loose their shirts, tussled ponytails, and they smiled, said, don't make it hurt. But we never listened. We did what we wanted, egg cars and apartments, poured soda in mailboxes, stole garbage can lids and flung them around like frisbees. We were tough then, before BD and student loans, checkbooks and cell phone bills, 401ks, insurance, car, medical, life's further down the line, but not rent. Rent is now, <laughs> work is now. Sausage, buy one, get one free at Safeway is now. Until Wednesday, after then it's something else, tater tots or cilantro or an oil change, a loose filling, something stuck in the garbage disposal, the cat has worms, and that light in the front keeps going out. And we just need a snow day, a holiday, or a deep enough cough that mother will say, stay in bed and take it easy, baby. Sometimes we forget how. Mm -hmm. uh, what is next here? Oh, I got all my poems mixed up now. Okay, here we go. Another old one. I uh, wrote this a while back, also in my chat book. Um, slight bit of context here again. Uh, as Felicia mentioned, I'm from New York, if you couldn't already tell by the Hackney accent. <laughs> um, and in New York, we have this thing called OTB, which is off-track betting. It's where uh, drunk guys who like to bet horses but can't make it to the track go in this room and bet on horses that they watch on the TV screen. So it's pretty much like the very end of society. Um, <laughs> this is where I grew up. I spent a lot of time there as a kid. So this, this is for my uncle. It's called Keep Your Fingers Crossed. I found him at OTB, playing the three horse to win, and a trifecta. I forget the others picked a place. The gate shot open. Uncle grabbed my hand, like in church. I thought it was broken but he wouldn't let go. He didn't say anything to me, just screamed at the TV, you're almost there, like it was having a baby. The three didn't place, the eight passed it halfway, the nine and five necked it out at the wire, and my hand was crushed like the beer can uncle picked up, downed, chucked in the trash. Then he cracked another, bet on the next three, and said to the teller, hell, it has to hit sometime. Uh, let's, let's move further ahead, more current stuff. Uh, I wrote this maybe a year ago or so, maybe less. Pretty much everything I'm reading here I wrote in about a year ago. I don't know why, pretty desolate. But uh, I read this actually at, at Wordsworth, my first gig, which I've had a great time doing. Uh, it's another one of the, the great programs that the city does here. It really supports the arts. So here we go. This one is called What We Forget When We Remember an Address. This is as Seattle as I can possibly get. <laughs> the air is clear except for the dust from the building going up, one of many around here. The workers are busy with talk of the weekend, who got some or didn't, and who won the big game. It was all the same each Monday, like alarm clocks stopped and Lucky Charms zipped locked, pushing kids out the door. You could see it on the second floor in the unit with no windows yet, beside the one where a carpenter sets the studs, where a man will throw darts till the wall chips and he's evicted and someone new moves in, plays music all night, maybe Marla, maybe Madonna, he hasn't decided. No one will sleep. The cats of the alley will creep in the bushes till sunlight comes. Then they'll stretch on the cement, not there long before. Cattle grazed and water went ways it's supposed. And man followed with talk, 
of only those things that kept him going. Uh, what's next? What's next? All right, I'll do this one. I read this actually in this room about two years ago. I was nominated for Poet Populous myself and didn't win, but the winner's somewhere out here. There she is. Uh, this is, uh, does anybody know what pojacking is? Nope. Anyone? All right. Pojacking is when you uh, take a poem written by somebody else and then rewrite it in a way that's somewhat your own. Um, being that I haven't been writing as much as I used to, I started doing this because it's real easy to take somebody <laughs> else's poem and write it, you know? Uh, I've done Emily Dickinson, I've done Walt Whitman, um, what else have I done? I've done Allen Ginsberg, and this one here is the first one I ever did. This is a Charles Bukowski poem. It was uh, titled Poetry, and I took it and rewrote it a little bit, but kept it as Bukowski as I could, and now it's entitled War. <clears throat> The bus driver's sighs stopped at the light as rain falls on the windshield. He doesn't have a chance, rides from Queen Anne through Capitol Hill and out to the CD. An improbable rain and an improbable timetable. We pass so many without a chance. And I realize that there isn't much chance for any of us. Peace won't save us and war won't save us. A good war or a bad war. We take a lot and use it until it is gone. Bombs drop, tax seasons begin. There are sick days and days we just call in. We try to cheat the machine. War, you kill any man and then another. The bus driver has Denny Way between Seattle Center and the Five. I sit next to a veteran who puts his feet up on the seat. There's a small tear rolling from one of the bus driver's eyes. He is ashamed to wipe it away. The people look ahead or listen to headphones or look out their windows. The tear rolls, rolls over the cheekbone, then down the face, then it's gone. MLK, says the bus driver, turning on MLK way. He's right at last. What a dubious thing. I get off at MLK. I need to smoke and have something to eat. I don't care about the bus anymore. It is a death toll scrolling across the bottom of a TV screen. I don't see it anymore. There will be more buses. I decide to smoke and eat after. I walk into the rain and out of the rain and take off my wet shoes and wait. Uh, next up, I only got two poems left, so I might as well just do these last two, huh? Uh, let's go with this one. This is probably the most recent poem I've written, well, of the batch here. This was part of a collection that I started six months ago that is one poem complete and three poems incomplete. <laughs> and probably should have another 15 or 20, but uh, those will happen eventually. I started this collection when I uh, picked up a book called Workin', which is by Studs Turkle, Turkel, Turkle, I'll go with Turkle. <laughs> um, and it was written a long time ago, way before I was born, or probably most of you here even. Um, and it's a book of case studies of different people's jobs. So he does bus drivers, he does um, factory workers, construction workers, receptionists, hookers even. I mean, he, he runs the, the gamut here. He goes through uh, all these different positions and interviews people and does little case studies with them. And across the board, pretty much everyone hated their job, no matter what they did, whether they made a lot of money or a little money. They all hated their jobs, which probably isn't that unfamiliar for most of us. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're Nick Licata. Then you love your job. <laughs> But uh, it was, it's a, an interesting book, and it kind of inspired me to make these little case studies into poems. So this is the first and only one that's complete, I think. And it's called Bus Driver, and you can probably figure out what it's about. <laughs> <clears throat> I've been driving this bus since MLK was Empire Way, when the idiots would pay with change and say hello as they got on. 
But now these idiots are too busy with cell phones and iPods, won't even look me in the eye, say goodbye as they get off. The wife says resign, but I got five more to retirement and a pension nice enough I'll never have to drive again. I tried for a desk, but they say guys like me will die on the bus before they'll let us off. Not an accident on my record, I gotta catch reflexes, never lose my cool when some idiot cuts me off. But I'm worn out, got hemorrhoids from so many double shifts, arthritis in my hands and wrists. And these idiots, idiots with no money that want on free, idiots with their dirty shoes on seats, idiots that open the emergency exit when it's hot, idiots at every stop, idiots. I'm calling it quits, leave the keys in the ignition, and I'll find my own way home. <laughs> like I said, they all hated their jobs. <laughs> Everyone. I can't say I can fully relate. I love my job. My job is cool. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, so last poem I got here. Um, it's part of what I hope will be a newer collection, but well, from my track Reddit record, it probably won't happen for another 10 years. No. <laughs> it's true. So this poem is called uh, Some Nights I Don't Sleep, and this is a pretty recurring theme of my life. <clears throat> Some nights I don't sleep. Rolling around bed like a tornado, whirling pillows and blankets, laundry, shoes, change on the floor but not that light shining from the porch. It doesn't help having a cat bald on my back. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> it doesn't help having a cat bald on the back of my head, a dog spread at my feet, and Jamie kicking me for stealing the mattress the animals haven't got. But it's not always them. Sometimes it's nothing, a dripping faucet, an itchy ass, the dogs yipping next door, the thought of getting up in just a few more. Or oh, it's everything, reworking lines of old poems, rewording sentences of old conversations, rethinking why I don't move home. I try to think good things then, about Jamie. She looks happy, wrapped like a fork and knife in a napkin. The dog and cat too, it's the only time they get along. Then a horn honks, a gunshot, the cop stops someone on MLK. I get up, piss, past the kitchen clock. 2.16, that's it, I'll be up till the crickets stop. By 4.19, I'm out, like the dog, the cat, the woman. But not like that light, it's going all night. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Brian. We need more Brian's in Seattle. Not, not just because of your poetry, but I love that accent. <laughs> and uh, every time I listen to it, I think, you know, Seattle's really a cosmopolitan town. You got people from all over. <laughs> um, well, now we have the poet populist of the year, Jordan Imani Keith, who's our sixth poet populist. And in addition to being a poet, she's a naturalist, educator, storyteller, and the 2006 Jack Straw Writers Program recipient. And in 2004, she was awarded an Individual Artist Grant from the Mayor's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs for the uh, choral poem, The Uterine Files, Episode 1, Voices Spitting Out Rainbows. Her publication credits include magazines, newspapers, radios, uh, television, video, silence, broken, and the anthology Maka Diaspora Jukes, Sister Vision Press. She's a founder and director of Urban Wilderness Project, which provides storytelling, restoration, adventure, and wilderness programming. Quite an adventure. <laughs> and, uh, Quite an adventure I'm looking forward to. Jordan, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> did everybody laugh as much as I just did? I love um, this job, and thank you, Nick. It's been wonderful to do this work. 
because first, you know, it's just like being a tree. If you don't do your bloom thing and you're not doing anything, you don't have anything to give, so it forces you to realize that poetry is important. And then when you realize it's important for you, then you realize that you have to give it out to people. So running around and trying to get other people to be poets is kind of my mission in life. Poets, storytellers, anybody who's going to speak up and say something and have fun with words. And um, for me, often that means that you're following me out into the trees, which shouldn't alarm you, because I usually bring people back, usually. Or send someone to find you. No, I shouldn't joke about that. I really do bring everybody back. Um, so uh, this collection that I'm going to read of things is from um, umbil umbilical topography is what I call it. Because I'm obsessed with the land and also with you know where I'm from and where we're from, all of us. And... Um, this is called Traveling Seeds. Strange fruit has black seeds. Papaya pearls dropping tropics in our mouths. Strange fruit has black seeds. Papaya pearls dropping tropics in our mouths. Long ago, long, long ago, before memory was born, there was an enormous tree larger than the arms of 40 people locking hands. And those trees' branches arch so high that some of them touch the belly of the sky. And on those branches were seeds. No fruit, just seeds. Small, brilliantly black, shiny seeds. Each seed was so small that it looked like a tiny, piece of polished glass. And when the wind blew, the seeds made this teeny, tiny, tinkling sound. It sounded like chimes dangling from the branches. The sound was softer and fuller than anything that can be imagined, but still, the seeds wondered what their purpose was. And so they leaned over and they asked uh, the water. And water didn't know. And water thought that was funny. So water asked when. And when just started to laugh. Seeds asking me what their purpose is. And they laughed and they laughed and they laughed so hard. And every time water laughed, she tickled the wind, and wind tickled her back, and they were laughing and laughing so hard that they became a storm. Well, when the storm's waves leapt up, they smashed into those branches, and those tiny seeds fell. Those seeds then came in waves. They washed up on the shores. They arrived at new lands and to new soils, places they'd never seen. They were spread out all over the world. And some of the seeds hid themselves. They hid themselves and they took with them deep, deep in the earth what they needed to remember. And it took 300 years for them to bloom. But when they bloomed, some of them came up through concrete. Then they began to make their purpose, each of them a new tree with new seeds. They turned into jazz on Harlem streets. They turned into saxophone sounds whistling in the dark. They turned into poetry, peeping round corners, telling everybody's business. They turned into heart surgeons, whispering beats to hands that would not let them cut. They signaled crossings at strange new intersections. They became bebop and hip hop, fubu, and you too, long ago. Before memory was born, a seed dangled, tinkling, black. That's a high, a hay bun or high bun. I don't know which way you say it. It's like haiku. It's the best of both worlds for me. So I get to put a little haiku in there, which I love to do, and tell you a story. And this is for the woman who taught me to tell haiku. Her name is Sonia Sanchez. Does anybody here know who she is? Anybody not know who she is? You can go, amen. 
I've been finding out, you know, I work with kids and, and I've been surprised and I work with some adults too to find out what people don't know, how there's like this history that's missing. Like Angela Davis, Pe four people don't know who she is. By the way, she's coming. Don't get in line before I do. <laughs> she's coming. <laughs> Um, so if you don't know who she is, Google her. That's what I told people. And they're like, oh, my God. So Sonia Sanchez, um, mother, teacher, poet, powerful woman, and my mentor, Mama Sanchez. Mama Sonia, Mama Sonia, Mama Sonia. Mama Sonia, Mama Sonia, Mama Sonia. Mama Sonia, Mama Sonia, Mama Sonia, Mama Sonia. I call you. Because when your lips broke, when your lips broke, I was born in the flood. And I chant you as though Babylon will fall just by speaking your colors. I am still carrying your teeth in my purse. Still carrying concealed weapons that bullet my breath across a tongue bitted by the yellow skin of my father's. I am still carving poems on the tablets of flesh, scraping mountains into children's eyes, leaving the haiku of switchbacks on the thighs of tomorrow's power. I tell them, weave the skin of America into memory. Put on forgotten robes. Do not let it be said that again, America herded the dark. That when the twin scales fell from our eyes, we continued down the road to Damascus as though we'd heard no voice. Mama Sanchez. Me and Brian worked at Hugo House together, and that's where I met him and had a lot of fun. And we actually worked in between. Since Linda's here, I'll say that. She also worked there. <laughs> but there was a great day where we decided not to do well. Actually, he started it. He was writing a poem. And then I was like, if he could be writing a poem when we were supposed to be working, I'm going to write a poem. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a good day, that. This is called The Sound of Seeds. Uh, listening to the same CD over and over again. The sound of silver spinning notes into the cooled office air is the closest thing that I can find to ocean now. Repetition is necessary for safety. The waves laughing and breaking at regular intervals hush the cry of sand being pulled under. Life always comes in pairs. Two by two, joy and disaster. Maybe disaster isn't. We're just not used to the sound of seeds breaking. Death puts our ears so close to the soil. The brown earth has gotten rich with the bodies and bones of eyes that hunted through the night before regurgitating sound into the stars. Gravity has so many meanings. Without it, my feet would not make it to your door. So these are some haiku. And uh, I lead, shameless self-promotion, I lead um, haiku hikes, but it's about promoting the woods too, for you to come out and have a moment. Um, in our city, we're blessed. You know, it's still called the Emerald Forest, Emerald City, Emerald Forest. That's what it feels like sometimes. If y'all, please tell me y'all know the Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> I'm afraid. But um, I just think it's important to find a quiet place. That's like my mission to help people to go and find a quiet place. So I'm bringing that in here with these haiku. I hope. and our water, where it comes from, so you know. Emerald drops rush to dance down city faucets. Emerald drops rush to dance down city faucets. A river jumps, 
spitting mist between rock lips. We kiss. A river jumps, spitting mist between rock lips. We kiss. Purple flowers kneel among the ferns, waiting for the curve of afternoon. Lightning quarrels with earth, tearing fingers from her maple fists. Lightning quarrels with the earth, tearing maple fingers from her fists. Red cedar fingers accuse the sky of abandonment. Red cedar fingers accuse the sky of abandonment. Limbless warrior fights the logger's chain with seeds. Limbless warrior fights the logger's chain with seeds. And this is the story of Grandmother Cedar, her red cedar fingers accusing the sky of abandonment. This is the story of Grandmother Cedar, limbless warrior fighting the logger's chains with seeds. There are many trees who are not here now. Ancestors who fell prey to the folly of men and their greed, those great ancestors whose bark fell like the bones of a thousand-year-old parent, have left their roots in the ground so that these stories might grow up. Long ago, those who were created with legs lived in harmony with those who were created with branches. Those trees were their grandfather's, grandfather's, grandfather's friends. And each year as they grew wiser, they added one ring inside to remind them that they were part of the circle of life. Each tree knew its job and its gifts and they whispered their secrets into the ears of those who could move. Some called to the children with wings, others called to the children with fur, and some sung to the ancient people who loved them. And then one day, grandmother was standing there. And she heard voices from far away. But she didn't recognize the cadence of those words. She hadn't heard them in the woods before. And she couldn't tell what they were saying, what the whispers were holding. So she looked up and she called to the gray belly of the cloud above her and said, drop some rain. Because she knew, just like those children that had always been with her, that those who were far away would come under her branches and seek shelter under the cedar tree. And so the rain did fall, and they came quickly and stood under there. And then she heard their words, she heard their whispers. They were saying, this is where we'll cut. As they looked through the trees, this is where we'll cut. This is where we'll cut. And there was nothing she could do. She thought at first there was nothing that she could do, but she called quickly out to the dug fur. She called quickly out to the hemlock, hide, hide inside of me. And they all dropped their cones and they hid inside of her. And to this day, when you walk through the forest, you'll see those seeds growing up, trees that we now love because she knew someday Someday, they'll want us back. Now, I hear strange things when I go in the woods. And it's not just because of how I spent my teen years. But I know that it happens slowly because this is how I was told it, that no one even noticed at first. The rust is what gave it away. Along the ridge line, the topography was being changed from uneven terrain and wooded slopes to simple flattened terraces that made stairs and nice places for condo complexes. But the trees, they were training the strangest colors. Perhaps it was the development. Disturbed soils. Autumn always brought a change, even the evergreen state. But the trees were turning red and brown in the oddest places and at the wrong times. Bill and Lucy noticed it first. Uncle Bill. 
had always taken Lucy out for walks. And she was the oldest dog in King County, and so was he, so they said. And he was out on his walk. And he said it was like watching Alice fall into the rabbit hole when Lucy disappeared, a beautiful black lab of 101 years old. Gone, just like that. Well, that's what the papers said, even though Uncle Bill had told them that is not how it happened. He called the editor of the Issaquah Times himself. Somebody's built a tunnel or a road or something. I'm telling you, that's where Lucy is. It, is that illegal? No signs or anything? No one called him back. No one seemed to investigate. She's lost in the tunnels. I'm telling you, I know my old girl. She knows the scent of all of those woods. It was the rust that gave it away. When Uncle Bill was taken to the Overlake Clinic with his arms slashed open, and he was saying, all the trees are sculptures, I'm telling you, metal and bronze and silver, supposed to look like moss or something when they're oxidized, and aspens and alders, he was hysterical. That's what they said. Poor man, he loved the dog. He's old, he's gone mad. But it was the rust that gave it away. The rust had infected his cut, the rust that poisoned his blood, 17 years since his last tetanus shot, locked jaw, cause of death. There was an investigation. We sued the hospital, they won. How could anyone be expected to believe the trees were bronze? Our lawyer's team found the tunnels, New Earth Lungs. It's what they named them, New Earth. The machines had large HEPA filters and they breathed out of the tunnel stacks, shaped like hemlocks, a climax species. We had finally figured it out. I'm gonna read a couple uh, Last poems. Are you afraid to go in the woods with me now? <laughs> the trees don't always talk to me. Sometimes it's the water. <laughs> this is called diaspora waters. Um, humans have often been compared to the sea found in cups of evolution, found in the chalice of divinity. Still, there seems to be a resistance to being part of the sea, not climbing out of it, but being it. 77% water at birth. We have so little solid ground and flesh to stand on. Internal oceans, like those of the planet, have different roles different makeup, different functions, the Atlantic within us, the black us. The Africa us carries currents from the west side of Africa, the largest continent whose forehead protrudes into the waters, the forehead, the mind of the continent, the center of memory, of speech, of recognized intelligence, leaves bits of land, erodes. Its granular flesh is carried from the shores of Ghana to the casino lined shores of New Jersey. Frowns arriving in waves leave furrows in the sand. The continent to continent wind walks on water looking for her children. Sometimes her memory twirls, winds itself up in despair like a top, like the lady on Market Street wandering in circles like she's lost something her feet more concentric with each turn until, like a clock, she raises her hands above her head and starts to scream. Nothing you can do with a restless soul. I go places to get pins, she explained to her parole officer, but it sounded like pins. Her accent was often misunderstood. He wrote it down. He put an asterisk for caution next to it. 
What will you do with these pins? He repeated these words slowly as though he were a therapist, not a foe. I'm sending them to Africa, she said, looking at him as though he hadn't been listening. Rachel leaned toward her travel companion as though it were a childhood joke or a secret that they'd shared. I haven't looked at these in years. The images had become two-dimensional inside the black acid-proof box. People who once had legs, arms, voices, and sense had been ironed out. Legs that stepped through the tall, malt-colored grass to pick the, up the lion's interrupted meal and hold the half-eaten reptile by its tail so that the hands that worked so hard to come on safari, to take photos, to find their African roots, could have a moment to hang their ancestry on. Everyone needs a place to hang their skin. Ida, Ida was keeping records using her hands and her voice to keep count, keep records, like her mother's gathering the weight of cotton, heads plucked, bodies burned, futures mutilated. She kept counting to quantify the crisis. The postcards were not considered obscene, violent, brutal, inhumane, evidence of crimes and mental illness. The postcards were considered trophies to hang on walls refrigerators, display with dead animal heads and large fish. They were the proof of boundaries, borders, lines in the sand, men at war and play, scorching African earth. Flags declaring what a free America would mean. Stories waiting to be told sat all over her, a grandmother's voice rocking memory into light gray eyes. We were slaves, then free, and voting came along with the Kluxers. While she talked, the hanging skin swinging from the back of her arm whipped the air like a large quilt snapping on the clothesline. Outside of the mixed matched van in scenes that whisked by like postcards. English was being spoken by brown girls in brown school uniforms. From inside the van, she watched as palm trees and ant hills swelled in her throat until she cried. Ghana was so beautiful. Never what they showed on television. And I'm going to read this last poem. Who in here knows the National Black Anthem? One, we got two. Who knows who James Weldon Johnson is? I'm a teacher, so I'm sorry for the quiz, but you know, I am a teacher. <laughs> So, and sometimes I need, because I want to know, like, do I need to say all this, or, so James, do you all know who James Weldon Johnson? Some, I see some, okay, five second history. James Weldon Johnson wrote um, what was often referred to as the National Black Anthem. It's a song that is very encouraging and often sung at assemblies, along with the Pledge of Allegiance. Look it up, Google it. Um, I refer to it in here. And I asked who was gonna, who knew it because I was hoping for singing. It's one of two poems that in the last year um, the University of Washington has asked me to write for their health day. Health, global health days. And um, their theme this year was um, for Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King. I think it was the peaceful road. But I was thinking about the stony, stony the road, which is the title of the song, so. I don't think that any of you are going to bust into songs since I only saw two hands go up. <laughs> and just so you know, if you can't tell by my voice in speaking, I'm not really that great of a singer, but that doesn't stop me. <laughs> Stony the Road. And this is for the children, because that's what I do, and I really, 
consider myself a child, so it's to encourage me to not give up and to remember all the work that our ancestors, regardless, regardless of our complexion, what our ancestors have done. And I'm going to try not to cry. I don't know why this poem does this to me. <clears throat> Oh, I have to give mad props to the library as I look at this line, by the way, because I have gotten so much love from, and you need to give up the love for the Seattle Public Library. And Chris, <laughs> and, all the, and all the librarians that I've had the pleasure of contacting, and uh, the reason that it clicked then was because this, I learned something. Every time I hang out at the library, Duh. I learn all these amazing things, but I learn them from just talking to the librarians. I sometimes don't get to the stacks. But um, so a librarian shared with me that she'd found this uh, piece of paper that um, showed the history of geometry and that when uh, many people were enslaved from Africa came here, that they actually had the same designs in their hair, braided in their hair, that were the geometric patterns of um, villages and things that they'd created. I was blown away. Isn't that amazing? Stony the road for the children. After we braided geometric memory into hair, after we hushed babies and earth so that they would stop screaming from their roots being pulled out, after we walked on wooded planks and water, and we were forced to change the planting of native lands after we learned that Harriet's chariot did swing low, after we tasted the strange fruit of freedom's seed, after Ida counted us like cotton, after that came Martin. Stony the road we trod, the skulls of our ancestors shone like cobblestones so that he would not get lost on the way to the mountaintop. Bitter the chastening rod, they carried lint in their pockets for Martin, dropping pieces like cotton crumbs so the little one could follow. They knew how it felt in the days when hope unborn had died. But when Martin was born, hope was screaming. Hope was breaking through cracks in sidewalks. Hope was hanging out like ghosts at the bus stop, whispering, sit down, sit down, sit down. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed? So, sighing, Rosa sat down, and Martin picked up our father's shoes like batons, and he passed them to the children. Four black girls from Dynamite Hill. He passed them over bridges on the way to Selma. He passed them over the incense soul of peace until the baton landed smoldering on the sidewalk. We have come over a way that with tears had been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered of when Emmett died, of when Edgar died, of when Malcolm died, of when Kennedy died, of when Kennedy died, of when Martin died, taking with him titles fit for a king, father, son, and spirit dreaming. Out from our gloomy past came Coretta, whose strength broke like waters until his holiday was born, until the King Center was born, until she made him legacy. Till now we stand at last with these peaceful shoes, with these batons needing new souls needing your souls to carry us.
where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Carry us till this nation returns to hope. Carry us till black dreams and white children really do ride together and go one place. Carry us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Seattle is really blessed to have people who really not just enjoy the city and our environs, environs but um, enjoy life and um, can express that joy of life and their wonderment in life in a way that allows all of us to share it. And I think uh, we call those people poets. <laughs> and we have some very fine poets with us today. And thank you for sharing your wonderment of life with us today. Thank you very much. And, and finally, thank you, Chris, and all the other staff at the library for allowing us to uh, be here today and for also being a co-sponsor of Poet Populist. And uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs> Can I make you late? <laughs> Can I make you late? <laughs> of course. Anger. That's what I think of the city. Okay. Frank wants to take a photo of the best. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. This is my uh, tenth day here in Seattle. Oh, you're from, I'm from Philadelphia. Really? Born and raised. Yeah, I've been here for about uh, 15 years now. I was born and raised there to hear you. Very nice to and meet you. to be in Seattle with you. Thank yeah. you. What's yeah. your name? Charles Eason. Charles? I'm from West Philadelphia, 56 and Lotus. Oh, yeah. we're practically neighbors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Else. Thank you so much for the incredible reading. <laughs> Hey! Are you here? It's wonderful. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> trying to look for people. In the back. Thank you for coming. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm. I'm trying to get a song out of other people. I know. <laughs> Thanks, beautiful. Thank you. Inspiring. Oh. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. up next to you. Oh, okay. Here's oh, here. Here. Jordan. Can we? Can here. we just go around? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Wait. Oh, where did you? Oh, you don't want to stand next to me. Okay. <laughs> you maybe should stand up on three. One, two. Oh, wait. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Frank. Thank you all. Cheese, huh? I know, we didn't have to say fun. Oh, you guys kicked that. Thank you. That was fun, Joel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, I forgot this shameless thing for home my class. A, I need help. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, I was on the verge of tears in the last one. Yeah, I was on the verge of tears in the last one. I was listening to her, I was just like, yeah, I know. Some of those I haven't had, I, she doesn't tell me poems in the house, even though I try and get her to. I can't wait for her to read them now. I know. I can't wait for her to read Yeah, she does. Hey, you guys want to go eat? We have to go. We have people coming over for some prayers tonight. We're still in the middle of painting. Yeah, I know. I was telling Felicia, though, sometime in the next couple of weeks we should get together. Okay. Well, there's an Italian restaurant, and I said, it's on 12th. 
Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, it's, it's, let's speak it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My socks off. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. It's great to see you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Now, now. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Good. Good. I'm glad. What's your name? Raul Jordan. Nice to meet you. I would have some more presentations. A few here and there. His cheap night, his, his white of, night of cheap wine and poetry, a couple right. of things. Are, yeah, that's fun. Come out to that. Yeah, Google me. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. Adam. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I forgot to see. Well, I'm building up photography, is what I'm working on. Yeah, with that. Yeah. I think I should get it when it's.